Howdy, that's me, and this is my workbench, Steady. He does something no other workbench can. He always stays level. Over cracks, on inclines, and even when you've had a little too much to drink and try to change his oil. Uh, what? He also goes up, and down, and even all around. Steady can theoretically support up to 1200 pounds, though I ran out of weights to test him, and he's fully powered off an old Ryobi tool battery, meaning no need for outlets and extension cords. I made Steady because I wanted a level workbench, but I also wanted a workbench that I could move around my garage. So I did what all great engineers do and took to YouTube to see if I could copy someone else's design. And while there were a lot of ultimate workbenches out there, I realized they all have the same fatal flaw. You see, despite what my friends and family tell me, the earth isn't flat. So when you build something, it can either be mobile, but only be as level as the floor, or you can lock yourself into a permanently level location, but you can't have both. Or can you? Here's my game plan. In my last video, I built a rideable school bus for my son using four linear actuators extending and retracting into the ground to tilt and move it. I want to adapt this design for a workbench by essentially just flipping the whole thing 180 degrees. The bus becomes a base, and the actuators, now pointing upwards, will attach to a tabletop. This setup allows me to attach casters on the base for mobility, while the actuators are able to extend or retract as necessary to keep the tabletop level. There are three main components to this project, mechanical, electrical, and software. Let's start with mechanical, because thankfully this should be the easiest part. The main challenge here was I needed to come up with a design that both allowed for the bench to be stable enough to use and abuse, but also allowed the tabletop to move independently from the base in two degrees of freedom. The obvious choice for the top was to build a torsion box. This would keep the top extremely flat, but also allow for space inside to hold the electronics and route the cabling. The base was inspired by what's called a waffle structure, which I first designed in Onshape as a solid body, and then turned into a 3D lattice version using Rhino 7 with the Grasshopper plugin, and finally brought it back into Onshape. I still didn't know at this point how to attach the top and base, but I figured it was worth starting to build the two halves and hope the answer would come to me when it was ready. And while I thought this would be the easiest part of the whole project since I was having a machine do the work for me, I couldn't have been more wrong. For some reason I can't explain... My CNC router wasn't producing the precision I needed. I had to cut out nine identical copies of two unique panels, or a total of 18 panels, but not a single panel matched. Each one of these troublemakers takes like three hours to cut out, so this was a big deal. I was 30 hours into cutting panels before I even thought to check dimensions, so I was in some real trouble if I had to start over. After days of troubleshooting my CNC, I finally discovered the solution. It was right in front of me the whole time. Just ignore the problem. I stopped trying to cut out more panels, and with a little widening of a slot here, a slight bend there, and a fair amount of physical effort, I was able to get enough of the panels to fit together to keep the project moving forward. I slapped some casters on the bottom, installed the linear actuators, and built the torsion box. But by hand this time. With the two halves built, I eventually had to face my big unknown. How would I attach the top to the base? The linear actuators have a hole in the extension rods and come with a mounting bracket and pin, but that only allows for motion in one plane. Maybe I could connect two brackets together to mimic the way my vacuum head moves, but that just seems too complicated. After weeks, or maybe it was months, of inspiration gridlock, it hit me. A ball and socket joint. I was able to find some 3 inch solid hardwood balls on Amazon. I drilled about halfway deep into those that I would friction fit onto each linear actuator. Then I cut a 3 inch hole out of a couple pieces of stacked plywood. This would act as my socket and be attached to the bottom of the tabletop. I was worried there'd be too much friction for these to move smoothly, but boy, did this work so well. Just look at those puppies glide. It was time to move on to the next challenge, electrical design. Thankfully, this should be the easiest part. I decided I wanted to get a little fancier than just a rat's nest of jumper wires on a breadboard like my last project, so I opted to design a custom PCB and order it without testing. What could go wrong? This custom PCB was really just a replacement for the breadboard and jumper wires. I was still using off-the-shelf modules and sensors, and as far as schematics go, this one wasn't too complicated. I have an Arduino Nano that acts as the brains of the operation, two motor drivers that can supply power to two linear actuators each via a Ryobi tool battery, and an inertia measurement unit, or IMU, that'll measure our orientation in space. I thought, because I'd used all these components before, that this would be a piece of cake, but I ended up really struggling here and exploded a few more motor drivers than I'd like to admit. 
Ultimately, it seemed my motor drivers were not rated for the current the linear actuators wanted to draw. I really didn't want to redesign my PCB, so I tried all sorts of things to make it work. Additional resistors, a current limiting buck converter, even some of my own tiers. Some of these things got me functional, but with limited performance, some didn't work at all, like the tiers. Eventually, I just had to swallow my pride and redesign the PCB. The new design was almost identical, but accounted for some larger, improperly specced, motor drivers, as well as splitting the power and ground circuits between the motors and the logic components. Finally, finally, I was able to apply power to the system without it overheating instantly. Now I just needed to add that juicy software sauce, and thankfully, this should be the easiest part. The software is really where the magic comes into play for this build, and that magic can be defined as a feedback control system. From our dishwashers to dryers to air conditioners, practically every aspect of our day-to-day -day activities is affected by some type of control system. So why not our workbenches as well? Say Steady is on an incline, so he's tilted down to the left. We have a desired or reference value that we know we want to get Steady to. In our case, that's zero, which would be level. We also have a measured value of Steady's current orientation from our IMU sensor. The error is the difference between these two values, or put another way, how different is our current state than our desired state? That error value gets sent over to our Arduino, and based on whether that error is positive, negative, and its magnitude, which is how big it is, it tells which linear actuators to extend, retract, or stop. Now this is called a control or feedback loop, because at this point, we repeat the process. We take a new measurement, which should be slightly closer to our desired value, recalculate the error, and extend or retract the motors again. This loop continues until the error is zero, meaning the measured value is the same as the desired value and steady is level. This is called steady state and is where steady's name comes from. Now, this is a slight oversimplification because we're just looking at a 2D example. In the real world, steady can be in eight different positions of error and each of them will require a different combination of linear actuators to extend or retract. This can be summed up here in the graph, but the important thing to note is that the logic of the feedback control system will be the same. Now, as you might have expected, like with any project, there's a bit of scope creep. I ended up deciding that just being level wasn't enough. Steady deserved more. I decided to add two other functions to the software. One was to make it act as a standing desk by being able to turn all the motors on or off at the same time. Pretty easy. And the other was to give myself a little more manual control and be able to move all the different motors independently for reasons you'll see later, which was also pretty easy. Now, because I wanted three different modes, I needed to add an interface so I had a way to switch between them and give input into the system. Not as easy. Given my limited number of analog and digital ports on my Arduino Nano, and my reluctance to upgrade to anything more versatile because I didn't want to redesign the PCB again, spoiler, I did, I opted for a minimal approach to a user interface. I did a joystick, three LEDs, and a push button. The LEDs will indicate what mode I'm in, the joystick will allow me to move between different modes and provide input to the system once I'm in a mode, and the push button will allow me to make selections and go back to the main menu. While a little janky, it does get the job done. So what happens when you combine a problem no one asked you to solve, some makeshift mechanical design, a pinch of questionable electrical engineering, and barely working software? You get 